Good morning, everyone. My name is Kevin Shendo. I'm the Education Director from the Pueblo of Jemez, and we're here to share our story with you about our work um, in language and the language movement happening um, in Jemez um, that has been happening for the last, uh, I'd say, 15 plus years. And so we have a couple co-presenters, and we'll come up uh, as we're presenting on our slides uh, and as we move forward with our presentation. We want to start off with when our leadership in 1999 really began the impetus in bringing our community together, and we were asked to envision what we envisioned Hamas looking like in the year 2010. So we had a community visioning session where we looked 10 years down the road in what we envisioned. And out of all the recommendations that came up from the community, education was the largest. And this visioning session dealt with everything that our tribal government deals with. So not only education, but healthcare, housing, environment, et cetera. And the three main themes that came out of the work that happened there for education was building capacity. How do we build capacity within our young people to be able to assume responsible leadership roles? How do we take ownership over the education systems of our young people um, so that those things that we prioritize as a tribal community are at the heart of what and how we teach our young people? And how do we redefine education? And redefining education really encompassed the integration of language and culture, of place-based learning, of experiential, all those opportunities that we could give our young people to give them a wealth of experience um, and knowledge as they move forward from our community into whatever career they chose. And so as we move forward with that initial vision, we began to look at how we work to take ownership over the education systems of our young people. And we began with the charter school movement, chartering our schools, first a KA school and eventually into a high school. And that was kind of our first move towards taking ownership. And then really began to focus on how do we now begin to look at integrating language and culture into curriculum and building what we want for our young people to know. And fast forward 10 years, between 2010 and 2013, we report it back to the community what we had accomplished based on that first vision. And then we asked them to revision for the next 20 years. So looking at vision 2020, and naturally things became a lot clearer. Just kidding. 2020. <laughs> so uh, just checking to see if you all are awake. So. And again, the priorities of education remain consistent with how we're moving forward in terms of our visioning and what we're doing for our community. And to give you an idea of the Pueblo of Jemez, for those of you that are traveling from afar, if you look west here, those are the Jemez Mountains. We're down in the valley um, on the other side of the mountains there. We all live in one village. We have a population of a little over 2,700. Uh, roughly around 25 to 3,000 live on the reservation, if not on the reservation just off the reservation due to our housing shortage on the reservation. And there you see some of the demographics that we have in terms of language speakers. Um, based on the 2010 census, which was self-reported, roughly 91% of our population that answered the census said they spoke some level of Hamas. And there was 9% that said on, they spoke only English. We did our own survey in 2006 using our community members, which went house to house, and we conducted over 1,000 surveys across generations and populations. And from that analysis, we roughly came out that our language fluency rate was being maintained at roughly 80%. And this graph here shows some of the data that came in. Um, along the bottom here, you see um, the age. So we started at four years of age, and we went year by year up to 20 years of age. And then we went every decade, every 10 years, because we knew that the language fluency in the upper, older age of the population was still strong. But we wanted to see what was happening with our young people. And, what the, and then on the side, the speaking levels, zero that they spoke no Hamas, six that they only spoke in Hamas, and that's all that they spoke with no English uh, in their conversation. So you see, based on the graph there, the levels that we got. And what we were seeing was that there were dips in the transitional periods of our kids going into elementary, middle, and high schools. 
So we're asking the questions of why. Why is this happening? And so how can we begin to address this? So as we move forward with the work, we pulled all our teachers together from our on-reservation schools. We have a tribal-based early childhood program, Child Care Head Start. We have a BIE operated K through six school. We have a K-8 charter school and a 9-12 charter school. And at that time, at the first retreat that we hosted, we pulled all of them together and we asked them three questions. And the three questions you see up there, and this was both Hamas teachers and non-Hamas teachers that worked in our school systems. And so we asked them to answer these three questions. What are the characteristics of the Hamas community? What are the characteristics of a Hamas person? And looking at the young people you teach, what do they need to know and understand from your perspective in order to continue the Hamas way of life? And this was the result. So everybody that was answered there was given stickies and they answered one thought per sticky. And when we analyzed all the data, these were the themes that came out in terms of what our own people and those educators that work with our young people thought our young people needed to know in order to continue the Hamas way of life and the language and culture-based education. And so the characteristics of the Hamas community on the far left became the framework. The characteristics of a Hamas person gave us the beginnings of our standards. What they needed to know and understand were the beginnings of our benchmarks. And then we also asked an additional question, looking at your staffing and the resources that we have available at your schools, what's immediately possible and what may be a challenge. And so this was what our language team then used to create our language and culture curriculum. And now we have it from early childhood to eighth grade that we've developed. Um, that we're having our schools pilot and, and work on. And one of the things that's, uh, I don't, you can't really see it, but that was important for us to note is on the very end of the framework and the standard, you have conflicted. And as educators and those that work with our young people in our community, we also know that our young people are impacted by what happens in the community and in their homes. And so conflicted represents all those things that our teachers and our educators brought up that impact our young people's learning, things that they bring from home, um, the baggage and things that happen, uh, whether it's domestic, in the home, or in the community, that impacts their learning. So as we move forward, we understood that in the rural area where we're at, we have limited economic opportunities. Um, and so realizing that, we understood that we had to work within the systems that educate our young people in order to make the changes that we wanted to see happen. So in order to begin our systems work, and that really was impacted by our move to establish our charter schools. Because our first school, the K through eighth, was a conversion school. The Archdiocese of Santa Fe had established a mission school in 1906 until 1997, and then turned it over to the tribe. And for two years, we tried to operate it as a tribal private school, but it was really challenging not having the financial resources to support a school. So at that time, their new charter law was being developed. And so our board worked alongside the drafting of the new charter law. And when the new charter law was, pro was passed by the state legislature, the tribe submitted the charter application to convert our mission school into a charter school. So that was the first charter school approved under the new state law, but also the first on a reservation. And having that history and that work, we figured we could start establish a high school. And so we began to do that work. And lo and behold, we got a challenge by the district. You know, they welcomed the charter school because it brought an additional 125 students into a public school system. But when we proposed a high school, that was seen as a threat. And so language and culture were integrated into that charter. And then we were challenged on that by the attorneys that the district hired saying that language and culture could be connotations of teaching religion in this public schools. And that focusing on language and culture, of specifically just Hamas, that we were trying to create a segregated school. And that created a situation that was very uncomfortable, not only for our community, but all the communities in the valley that um, supported our school district uh, and worked and had young people attending that school district. 
So we went through the whole process. The charter was denied. We had to appeal to the state, and both the district and the tribe presented to the state. After an hour, they voted, and the State Board of Education voted 12 to 1 to overturn the local board's decision and grant the tribe the charter. At that time, a lot of us working on that movement were very young, just out of college. And I think part of our success was part of our ignorance. We really didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. Because when that charter was approved, we realized we didn't have facilities, we didn't have a curriculum, we didn't have a school board, we didn't have a principal. And we were going to be, next step was to start a school. And we didn't have the first clue of how to do that. So that experience really taught us a lot. That if we were going to change systems, we needed to work collaboratively. So now, fast forward 15 years, we started what we call the Education Collaborative. Reached out to the district, reached out to our school boards, the BIE, the public schools, the charter schools that serve our young people. Bringing them to the table to share with them, this is the vision of the community. This is what we're working towards in education and in moving forward. How can we come together and collectively support our young people? So now, the Education Collaborative has grown to not only include our schools within the community, but the schools within the district and reaching to our neighbors of Pueblo Zia all the way up. So we meet monthly with our principals and administrators to discuss common issues challenging our systems of education, looking at priorities that we can introduce to support our young people from the tribal level and coordinating and collaborating with the schools. And so really looking at this graph here has really looked at we have the vision of the community. We're not gonna forego that vision based on some funding or some initiative coming from the school system. But we wanna look at how can we come to the table and work collectively. Rather than compete for students and compete for resources, how can we come together and share those resources, go after those funding sources, and who's in the best position to apply on behalf of our collective efforts. And so, in terms of the systems change, that first experience taught us a lot in understanding that we wanted to integrate language and culture into our Head Start program. And so, in doing so, you'll hear about the story of what happened. But we were fortunate in the work that we did with our research partners, our hired institutions, and national organizations to influence the changing of Head Start regulations to now read that any federally funded Head Start program can deliver their instruction in the home language. And that if a child comes from a home where English is spoken, the program is no longer required to teach them in English. So that door has opened, utilizing current systems that are in place. You know, we've also worked with the state now, and we'll share a little bit more of how we look at assessments differently. And so as we move forward in the work that we're doing, sharing with you that we come from a position where we have limited resources, but we're looking at the things that are possible. And collectively, we're coming to the table. And that's the beauty of this collaborative, as I shared with one of our teachers, is that the beauty of it is we're coming to the table. Sometimes we agree in how to move forward. Sometimes we may disagree. But the beauty of it is that you have two tribal governments, two tribal departments of education, BIE school systems, public school systems, charter school systems, and our tribal programs that have a stake in education are coming to the table and collectively moving that vision of our community forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker that will go share with you more specifically of what's happening in terms of the Language Immersion Program. But we felt that this piece of background and history was necessary so that you understood where we've come from, where we're at, and how we're moving forward. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lana Garcia, and I'm a, a tribal member of the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, I'm also a mother to three teenagers. Well, one teenager, she's going to be 16 next week. So I already know I'm going to be asked about driving. <laughs> and then I have two preteens, 12 and 11. Um, I'm also a new wife. 
I say new because we just um, made it a year on September 25th, so I'm new to that role as well. Um, I'm also the program manager for the Wallatoa Head Start program going on 10 years. And um, when I came into my position, um, I, I have a degree in uh, English communication arts. So I'm supposed to be an English teacher. And um, I, I guess God had other plans for me, um, which reminds me of a joke I heard once is, if you want to make God laugh, you tell him your plans. So um, at this time, I want to share with you um, about our program in Hamas. So this is my staff. I have, I'm very fortunate that I have 18 speakers of the language at my program. We serve 68 children and their families. I'm very grateful for them for coming on this journey with me. Um, it is a journey where we've had our ups and downs, but we continue to move forward. And I just wanted to take this time to acknowledge them because um, I, I, no one can do this work alone. So I'm very grateful for them. They're back home. Um, teaching the children, and so I'll do my best to share my story, our story. So we are in our fifth year of implementation, and we continue to do this hard work and this heart work because we truly believe that our children are the future. Without our children knowing their culture and their language, our Hamas way of life will cease to exist. And so we're very fortunate that in our community, we have a very vibrant and lively culture. So um, we have lots of opportunities to expose our children um, to the culture and to a very um, rich tr traditional calendar. In our second year of implementation, we realized that the mission and vision that we had didn't really truly reflect um, the way we believed and, and didn't reflect the hearts, our hearts. And so we gathered our parents, our staff, and other community members, and we asked everyone to develop a mission and a vision that would um, truly reflect our purpose and, and what we believed. And so this is what we came up with, and this is um, what we live by. We use a community-based approach uh, where the community is an extension of our classroom. So I mentioned earlier that our community is very active. We have lots of things going on, and so um, it's not common, uncommon to find our children throughout our community, um, visiting the places that they're learning about, visiting elders. So um, we're very fortunate to have the support of our community. So professional development has been critical on our journey. And these are some of the partnerships that have been va very valuable to us. Um, for me, especially in guiding the program, in strengthening the program, um, I continue to reach out to um, mentors in the field of language revitalization uh, or maintenance uh, to help me in these areas. And also for my staff, you know, it takes, um, it takes a, you have to have tough skin because, you know, people, you know, will come into your classrooms and, and give you constructive criticism. And, you know, as teachers, sometimes that's hard. And I'm grateful to them because they've opened up themselves and allowed um, other people to, to help them. 
So one important partnership was with the University of Colorado, which funded our Becoming Hamas Photo Voice project, which you see um, the, pro the photo voices in the back, um, set up in the back. So the purpose of the photo voice was to help us understand the means by which children are socialized in a TOA speaking context. And the implications of this research was to develop a research and culturally based curriculum that is Head Start approved because we are still a federally funded program and so we're tied to those federal regulations and, and those regulations state that we have to use a research based Head Start approved curriculum. Another implication is to develop um, and use um, rich linguistic cognitive resources um, of Hamish children. So the Photo Voice Project is a community-based participatory research method that used cameras to tell or share a story. So in this case, Head Start parents were given the opportunity to, to share their beliefs about how or what children should know in order to be Hamas. So through this process, 467 photos were taken. And, and they had to answer each of these questions that you see. What should Hamas children learn in order to be Hamas? How do they learn these things? And how does Head Start support or not support this learning? So parents were given up to two weeks to answer these questions using photos. And they had this little badge and, and they could go around the community and take pictures. Um, this process was also approved by our tribal council because um, photo taking is not permitted um, in some of some areas of our community. And so, but for this project, um, Tribal Council gave us permission to do so. So um, after the photos were taken, we'd meet again and everyone could see the photos and then the parents voted on which picture they felt um, captured that question or answered it um, best. And so through that process, uh, 25 photos became um, the display that you see here today. And um, besides the photos, you, all, you can also see that there's a text that is, comes along with the photo and the parents also um, had to explain why they took the picture. So thematic analysis was used to identify the themes in each picture and across pictures. And as a result, um, there were seven themes that parents identified that children should learn in order to be Hamas. So what you see there are cultural knowledge, gender-specific knowledge, values, principles, spiritual beliefs, ceremonial knowledge, and Towa, our, our Hamas language. So these themes have shaped, guided, and developed the framework for how we teach our children at Walatoa Head Start. It is a unique education and one that we feel every child deserves in Hamas. So these themes have also been incorporated in the different aspects of the program. We have monthly fatherhood nights, we have motherhood nights, and other lot of other <laughs> nights, grandparent days, um, all these events that we have, um, these themes are incorporated into those areas as well. So thankfully, as I said, Tribal Council has been a big supporter of our I Am Hemish, I Speak Hemish movement. First, by approving our photo voice project, and then second, by approving our conversion from dual language to a full language immersion program. And experts will tell you that this step is really critical because it protects your work, past, present, and future. 
And here are other critical steps that the program has taken uh, for the past five years. When we started our immersion in January 2013, the, the resolution um, was approved December 2012. So a month later, we started um, taking steps towards uh, conversion. So um, one of the things that we decided early on is that we're very fortunate that we have a lot of speakers in our program. And so, you know, the one thing that we can all do is speak. And so we, we had to become very disciplined. So in the morning when we came in, it wasn't good morning anymore. It was, I mean, that in itself is hard. Um, um, so we had to remind each other and help each other, support each other along the way. Um, we also started to conduct our meetings, um, our graduations, um, our Christmas programs, everything was done in the language. And so I myself had to um, learn um, formal, for, how to dr address people formally, things like that. So, you know, I, I had to do, set that example as well. Sec another thing that is critical was um, um, assessing our center, our classrooms, because we wanted them to reflect a natural language learning environment. And you know that in our classrooms, a lot of times we everything's so colorful. And, um, and when we thought about how we learned language um, as children, we learned it in the home, in our communities. And so we started to make, uh, make those changes. Um, teachers started to bring um, their own baskets and shawls and things like that from their homes so they could put them in their classroom so that, you know, we wanted someone, visitors, anyone who came into our classroom to say, oh, I'm in Hamas, and this is a Hamas classroom. So those things were um, very important to us because also the items that they brought home also would help promote um, the language use in the classroom. Another thing that was important is um, we started closing the first Friday of every month for our program planning. And when we first started, it was kind of like, okay, that's the teacher's responsibility, and it's not. It, you know, this, as I mentioned before, this work has to involve everyone. And so we started including our, our cooks, our bus drivers, everyone had to be a part of this planning process so that if we were covering um, harvest, then the teachers could, uh, the cooks could um, make some, lunch could be around that theme as well. And so that was another thing that was really important during this um, in our journey. This philosophy we adopted from our Hawaiian ohana. Um, in 2015, we received funding from the Kellogg Foundation um, to strengthen our language immersion program. And so we wrote the grant and we wanted to take all our staff to Hawaii so that they could see what they were doing and just to get ideas from them and uh, just to learn from them. And really, it really impacted our staff because they were like, we're doing those things already. They really felt like, okay, we know what we're doing. This is, you know, um, it really um, refreshed them and, and it um, strengthened them when they came back and they, um, upon our return, they decided, okay, we have to protect our language like the Hawaiians do. They talked about um, being language protectors and, and making sure that English was not a part of their family, their community. And we said, we need to have that same passion as well because English is everywhere. I mean, we, um, 
you know, your phones, TV, everything, it's everywhere. And while they're in school, we wanted our school to be a place where only our word language was heard. And so upon our return, we came up with this language enforcement plan. And um, so grateful because the staff really took over this process and, and they wanted, one thing was um, to establish who we were to anyone and everyone. So we came up with a protocol for answering the telephone. So when you call the center, um, our administrative assistant is answering in the language first. If you walk into the center, you're greeted in the language first. So these were some of the things that we decided to do when we came back from Hawaii. So as I mentioned earlier, um, we are still a federally funded program tied to federal regulations. So here we have um, taken the Head Start Early Learning uh, outcomes framework and we've made it our own and it's still under construction but um, here we want it to demonstrate that our language and culture is at the core of everything that we do and it's not like a, a piece of the framework or it's not a component of the program it's everything we do it's the center the core of the program The themes from each of those photos that you see in the back, those were organized as sub-themes to follow our traditional calendar. So the, the sub-themes are ceremonies, values, principle, beliefs, family, and planting. So since we're in the fall season, um, we're teaching about um, harvest, feast, some of those things. We, we also are in the middle of um, teaching about the importance of corn and, and, and its uses, the different uses that we have. And so dancing, praying, um, our children begin each day with a prayer and they also make the cornmeal. Um, they do the whole process, shelling the corn, grinding the corn, and then they use it in their classrooms. And if there's enough left, they take some home with so the families can use it as well. Self-identity is really important to us. And so some of the first things that they learn is they learn their, to introduce themselves um, using their Indian name, their clan, and their moiety. So our program is designed to engage the parents and the families of the children. And so we created an, a family engagement calendar where the parent, where, what, where um, the families can reinforce the child's learning in the school. So they get a copy of the lesson plan and then the calendar was aligned to um, engage the families at home and tie it to what, what the child is learning. So here, families were asked to create at home a shield for their child to use at school so that they know what their Indian name means, um, which clan they're from, and uh, the moiety that they dance on. In this home activity, parents created a family collage and they use these um, to learn the, a song that um, identifies uh, the family members living in the home. This family project had parents um, creating a replica of the kiva that they belong to. And afterwards, teachers made graphs of how many students belong to the turquoise kiva and how many belong to the pumpkin kiva. And we used the pictures of the children. So we really tried to keep English words out of the, our program. Um, and as you notice, some of the posters the parents had uh, made, they would write down in English what it was. And so we have work to do, but um, we're, we'll get there. And we give our children lots of opportunities to engage with 
the speakers of the language. And um, as Kevin mentioned earlier, we're very fortunate that we still have a lot of speakers, but we, um, as much as we can, um, we try to be out in the community. Um, and one of the other things that we did was we have MOUs with the different tribal programs that we have, such as social services, behavior health, and they, they have to come and present uh, and to the children in the in the classrooms, and we asked those programs to send tribal members so they could present in the language. So for the past 10 years, we have seen um, an evidence of a language shift in our community, and especially in our Head Start age children. Um, and we have used different ways um, since we started this process to determine fluency or to assess proficiency. And I'm still learning which one that we want to use or what, which one I want to use. But basically, fluency for us is the ability to speak easily and smoothly or the ability to hold age-appropriate conversations. And so we, we're trying to figure out what that is. And um, it's really amazing when I, I spoke to the teachers and asked them, like, what are they saying? What are our children saying? And one teacher tells me um, that, he, that one little boy told him um, that he was eating gum. And he pulled it out. And he said, see this gum? This gum belongs to me, and I'm putting it right here. Please do not throw it away, because I'm coming back for it later. <laughs> wow, isn't that amazing? Like, wow, you know, like our children, you know, we're, we're very happy, and we're, we're, we're so fortunate that we have such strong communicators of the language, and that is something that we, you know, that success to us, you know. Um, we're still learning, but what we do know is that our language is not an academic language. It's not, it do, really doesn't belong in the school, but unfortunately because of the factors um, involved, you know, that's, we're teaching it in the school, but our language is a, a language of the community and it lives there. And so what I want, or what we believe is that we want our children to be able to participate in the community. That's success to us. So I always, you know, a couple of Christmases, I was sitting there, we had a buffalo dance, and we, I was sitting there watching. Three of our Head Start boys were standing with the drummers, the singers, and they were up front. And and I don't know if they, they did it on purpose, but the... The males, all the males, they lowered their voices so the children's voices became really loud. And there they were singing so strong and powerfully and just with so much confidence. And, and I thought, those, those are our boys from our school. You know, that made me so happy. And I said, that's, that's what it's about. That's what we're trying to, to have is we want the program to foster that, to nurture that. Um, and um, we don't want um, assessments or any of those things to like, we, we don't want to label our children. We want, we want assessments that empower our children and our families. So that's something that we're still working on and you know, um, hopefully we can find something that fits for us that's, that authentically identifies our children. Um, or authentically assesses our children. But um, after yesterday's presentations um, and the new knowledge that I've gained, it's time to go back to the drawing table and, and to work together again. So um, I thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Lana. And so now we're transitioning. Um, as Lana shared, our language is not written. And... Um, We've heard a lot of different communities and different perspectives that you heard over the last two days. And that was really a decision of our religious leaders, that they didn't want the language written because they felt that once we write it down, it's no longer ours and anyone can take it from us. 
So we're very cognizant of that as we move forward in terms of education. And as Lana stated, we're not looking to make Hamas an academic language where we're teaching everything, all subject matters in Hamas throughout the education system of our young people, but teaching them those critical pieces they need to be able to function within our community and the traditions and the ceremonies and moving forward. So one of the things that we've been fortunate to do is that we've been able to, with the work that we're doing, apply for private foundation funds to support the work and to help move our process forward. So this most recent grant that we received from the Kellogg Foundation, it's a three-year grant, and it's to not only strengthen what they invested in early in with the Head Start program, but to transition our kids into the elementary schools. We have kids that feed into a public school, a charter school, and a BIE school. So two of the schools that we work with are represented here today, and as part of this grant, funds have been given to those schools to support educational assistance, supplies, materials, professional development, et cetera. And so we're now looking at how do we transition our kids from two years of the Head Start program into kindergarten, into first grade. And so the next speaker is coming from the charter school as this is their second year. They piloted it last year and they're implementing again this next year. And on the slide, you'll see also information on Hamas Valley Elementary. They're a part of our efforts now too, but they're piloting this year. Um, so you'll see their information up there, but the presentation is gonna focus on the work that has been happening over the last two years at our uh, San Diego Riverside Charter School. Good morning, my name is Melissa Yepa from Hamas Pueblo. I am um, representing our Riverside Charter School. I've been in education going on 14 years. I started my education in kindergarten, uh, eventually moved to my ideal grade of second grade. And then to support our language immersion, I shifted from second back into kinder uh, two years ago when our first um, students came in from uh, Head Start. So just to give you an idea of our Riverside Charter School, it is a K-8 school. Um, student population is about 94. 98% uh, of them are, are from our uh, Pueblo. So last year was our first kinder immersion um, from the Head Start. That was our first year, and that was my shift coming out from second back into kinder being that myself and our bilingual teacher are the only certified um, teachers that speak the language. So that was a, a change that we had in our school to help with the efforts of our um, maintaining our language. So then this past year um, is our second, our kinder, I'm sorry, going back to the summer. So our first year immersion was my shift to kinder. And then um, the summer, our kinder graduated into first, and then we had our incoming Head Start coming into the, the current school year as kindergarten. So we, in support of that, we had a summer immersion program and always using um, the traditional relevant themes, which at that time was water, and uh, we incorporated the language using that theme for that summer immersion program. And so last year was our second year. So then again, we did some shifting, we did some um, hiring with the Kellogg money to support and to make our efforts uh, more effective. So I continued to stay in the kinder program. Our uh, bilingual teacher moved to first grade along with hiring, um, EAs, TOA speaking EAs in our kinder, first, second, and then not only that, we have them all the way up to six so that our kids are learning, uh, hearing the language throughout the day in those classrooms. So our instruction, 90-10 model, our EAs really help support that. Uh, 90 minutes of, um, or 90, 90, uh, 90-10, meaning majority of that is TOA. And that is happening because of our EAs, and we're lucky to have them in our schools. 
So um, first grade is our certified TOA speaker that you see in the above picture, and then she has a full-time Hema speaking aid as well. Um, another thing that we're doing to help support our EAs to getting their um, degrees in education is to help them get through um, in completing their educations to that, so that they can obtain their um, degrees or certification and to be actual the head teachers in these classrooms. So we are hoping that with the support of um, higher institutions such as UNM, uh, we are hoping to get them through that teacher pipeline so that they too can come back into our classrooms as the teachers. And that way we have more than just myself and Erlene. So being that this is the second year, we are still working on implementing, utilizing the language and looking at ways to do that. So the things that I have started in my classroom are mostly interdisciplinary and also intergenerational. We are working closely with our community field. Uh, our community field has apples, apple trees. They've planted corn, chili, squash. Um, and we do go out there and we, like the one up top uh, picture in the above photos you see, actually all of these, I'm sorry, was an apple project that we did with our partnering with uh, kinder and third grade classes. So we picked the apples, we prepared them, and made them into um, our traditional pies, and then delivered them to our um, tribal leadership, the offices out there. Always incorporating the language, always using the culture, and giving these kids the opportunity to speak the language throughout the whole process. So that's something that we are doing in our schools right now. And then, um, is that the next one? Yeah, so then this then leads us to finding um, assessments. How do we ass assess our kids? So this is, again, what Lana said. We are looking to um, find authentic assessments that will support what we are doing within the classrooms with the language. And um, the thing that makes it hard is that our language is not written. So we are looking at different ways to, to bring in these assessments to show you know, whether or not our kids are becoming proficient or fluent in the language. And Kevin will, will talk more about that. And that concludes my presentation on our, oh wait, sorry, no it doesn't. So going back then down to just the last slide, I just want to, um, to kind of elaborate on this. This last two lines are pretty um, important to remember is that a lot of the times our kids do go home to the home where they will speak English. And a lot of the times we hear our teachers or our, you know, presenters or whoever say, you know, they'll go home and they'll speak the language. What's, why are we, you know, doing what we're doing in the, in the schools? And I think that that's something that we need to put aside and not think about and just do what we need to do within our schools to keep the language alive and not worry about what they're going to, what language they're going to speak at home. The important thing is that these kids are with us more, a bigger chunk of the day, and we need to be speaking to them in the language and teaching it using the language and the culture and encourage to, for them to continue to speak the language at home. Um, and so we continue to do, the, do that, and we are looking to ways to strengthen our programs, being that this is only a second year we are looking at ways to make our program stronger and um, looking at innovative ways to do that. So I will now turn over to Kevin and he will talk more about assessments. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Melissa. So in terms of the assessments, as I shared earlier, we're looking to change systems. How can we work with current systems that serve our young people to be able to support the vision of our community? Uh, both Lana and Melissa mentioned our assessments, and that's one of our biggest challenge here in New Mexico, where the state keeps promoting English language literacy by third grade. And so for the last year, as we've gotten this Kellogg support and strengthened the immersion programs, we've been telling them, our kids that are coming through the immersion and leading into these transition programs are not gonna be English literate by third grade. So what are you gonna do to support our kids in our schools? Finally, we made a little crack in that door. In June, we had our education retreat where the state came and met with tribal representatives. We had the Pueblo of Jemez, we had the Pueblo of Zia, and representatives from the Acoma Ed Department, where we then began to discuss if the state was to invest in an alternative assessment or a different assessment developed by the tribes that supported and measured what kids are learning in their home languages, what would it look like? And then we were adamant that each one was gonna look different. Each one was gonna take shape based on that tribal community and what they were doing and the status of their language and where they were at. And so now we've been working the last couple months and I shared our first draft of that work with our educators here from Hamas and the language team from Zia that are here in moving forward. The state has committed resources. They're looking to pilot this with at least five tribes or a handful of tribes. So that has opened the door again. And so really moving forward with this work that we're doing is continuing to challenge, whether it's the state, whether it's federal funding agencies, whether it's um, our local school boards, to continue to move forward in supporting the vision of the community. And that has really helped to take shape. And this all wouldn't be possible without our collaborative efforts. Because as Lana said, we cannot do this work alone. We need the buy-in of our principals, our superintendents, our teachers, our parents, and our tribal leadership. Because it takes all of us advocating on those different levels to make change happen and significant change. And I say this because when our charter was denied at the local public school district, we felt that the tribe had a government-to-government -government relationship with the state. So we worked with the New Mexico Charter School Coalition to change the charter law so that the state became a chartering entity. You've heard of the work in terms of the regulations with Head Start. And now in moving forward, our leadership from Hamas and the governor of Zia are gonna be meeting with the federal communications uh, FCC tomorrow. And we're pushing another project to bring fiber to our communities, high speed. And so it's not only in language and culture that we're working, but we're looking at how can we support the overall development of our schools in all areas and eventually to benefit our communities. So in closing, we have a short video to share of what's happening from our Head Start program, transitioning into our Riverside Charter School and then into the Hamas Valley Elementary. So we hope that you enjoy this final video uh, as a closing. And as we're setting that up, I just wanna acknowledge our group that's here joining us today. Um, we have uh, members from our Hamas language team, if you'll stand up. Then we have members from our San Diego Riverside Charter School, our teachers and our EAs. And then we have our teachers and the EAs from Hamas Valley Elementary School and our foster grandparent program. And the two teachers are in the back too as well. If you'll wave. Candice and Lisa. So it takes a collective, not only our own community members, but our supporters in the schools to make this happen. So I wanna thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our story, our journey with you, and we hope that somehow we can continue to collectively move our work forward.
Nó quá ha. So nó đã wish. So that concludes our presentation. Again, we thank you for giving us the time to share our story and our journey.